Okay. Hello and welcome to a long overdue four minute mull. I think it's been almost four weeks since I last spoke to you. And that's because I've been traveling first from South Africa to London, then up to Leeds, back to London. I had a week in Dublin for world rugby work, then back to London, and now eventually over to the USA, which is where I am right now sitting in a hotel room, where I want to talk to you very briefly about two things. Number one, the futility, to quote from the scientific authors, of the salbutamol anti-doping test. You may have seen about three weeks ago, a study came out suggesting that the upper limit that is currently used to detect doping with salbutamol has been challenged by a pharmacokinetic model. And then number two, does doping even work? And as we will discuss, those two concepts are in fact related. And we know that because of an excellent article that was written by one Susie Clementson, who you may know from Twitter as Festina Girl. Here is that article. It is on the Cycling Tips website, and the big picture banner at the top is that of Chris Froome, not surprisingly, because he's the one who put salbutamol in the news by virtue of that positive test at last year's Vuelta. There's Susie, and the title of the article is Piss Take, which I think tells you a little bit about what you are about to read. And what Susie has done in this case is she has contacted one of the authors of that paper, an Adam Cohen, based out of Holland, and she has spoken to him a little bit about it and the background and his particular beliefs, not only about salbutamol, but about doping in general. So I think that there are two interesting things that emerge from that article. And the first of those, which I'll touch on very briefly, because I've already had a few things to say about this on Twitter, so do go back and check the timeline if you're interested in the detail, is the actual study. This is the paper that was published by these authors in which they claimed, to use their words, that the salbutamol test was futile. And the premise behind that, of course, is that they built this pharmacokinetic model based on an existing dog model, which they then scaled for human use. And that model predicts that under certain circumstances, about 15% of athletes who are using the legal amount of salbutamol will actually fail the test. Now, there are a couple of problems with that model, or challenges that that model will face if it is ever used in an arbitration proceeding. The first are the inputs that go into making the model, in the sense that you, you're basically choosing A, B, C, D, F in different combinations and different amounts in order to get your answer. And then also how much variation or variance do you allow in those inputs. And I think those two things together will be questioned. And when you have got actual human research, I think that holds sway over a pharmacokinetic model based on dogs. So I don't think that it's particularly strong as evidence to try and overthrow the Chris Froome salbutamol uh, finding. And then the second issue with the model is how you then run the model. And, and what they did was, and I say this in the articles, they really loaded the dice. They said, let's run our model with the most extreme situation possible. In other words, we're going to see what happens if an athlete takes the absolute limit, 800 micrograms of salbutamol per day, every 12 hours. And under those circumstances, you get all these false positives. My feeling is that in the real world, athletes don't do that. They don't take the maximum amount and then 12 hours later, the maximum amount. Because if they did, we would see a lot more false positives. And the fact that we don't means that either the model is incorrect or option two is the model has very little external validity. It doesn't apply to the real world and to what athletes actually do. And it's weird because if, if that was my model, and again, acknowledging all the issues with building a model and its variants, the way I would have run it is from the other direction. I would have said that if this is the level in the urine at which an athlete fails a test, what is the minimum dosage that would cause one in a hundred athletes to exceed that level. So I would have tried to ask it from the other direction and then see how robust or specific that test might actually be. And then the second thing, which I think is actually more interesting, certainly philosophically, is the attitude of these researchers towards doping and performance enhancement. And you see this right at the top. The very first quote in the article is Cohen talking about how rarely we see a substance that takes someone who's already quite good at something and makes them better. He acknowledges that in medicine, 
you can give drugs to a sick person and you can restore them to normal function. But his opinion seems to be that you cannot go beyond normal function. And so therefore, in an elite athlete population, doping does not work. Lower down in the article, same thing. They challenge the concept that performance can be improved through doping. And they say that instead, the only reliable way to get better is to practice. Now, we will make the link between practice and doping in a moment. But if we just return to their premise, what they are basically saying is that doping does not enhance performance. And they've got form in this regard because you might recall a couple of years ago there was a study which suggested that EPO does not improve endurance performance in cyclists. And that study included many of the same people. So this is not a new position that they occupy. It is in fact one of the central principles that they bring to their anti-doping research. So what do we make of that? As a physiologist, in fact, let me start by not beating around the bush. I think it's a bizarre and ridiculous concept. From start to finish, I think it's outrageous that you can try and argue that drugs don't work on elite athletes because they're already healthy. It, it shows to me a complete lack of insight and understanding around what happens to an elite athlete when they are approaching the physiological limits and stretching and challenging their physiology right towards breaking point. So I don't think that these doctors and scientists have got any appreciation for that. But even if we apply their own logic, it fails for numerous reasons. Let's look at their logic. They're saying that a sick person benefits from drugs because they restore them to normal function, but that you can't go beyond normal function. Now ask the following question about an elite athlete. If you look at that athlete, whether it's Chris Froome, Simon Yates, Tom Dumoulin riding the Giro, whether it is Elliot Kipchoge running a marathon, whether it is David Rudisha trying to break the 800 meter world record, if you looked at that athlete with about 100 meters to go, are you looking at a healthy person or are you looking at a person who is physiologically very close to failure and therefore quote unquote unhealthy? I'd argue the latter. If you took that snapshot, you'd see a person whose heart rate was almost 200, ventilation through the roof, body temperature close to 40, 41 degrees Celsius, muscles and joints screaming in pain because of all the biochemical and metabolic changes that have occurred during exercise. My point is, that individual in that moment is not healthy. They're not healthy because they are stressing and challenging their physiology to such an extent that it is on the verge of failing. And we recognize that failure as fatigue during sports competitions. Now, if I'm a doctor and I come to you and say, here is a drug that will ensure that more oxygen gets to your muscles and helps you get back to normal function when you are pushing the very boundaries of physiological performance, then that is doping and it will have a benefit because it's being applied to a person who is not healthy as a result of exercise. So even their logic fails because doping corrects the stress that exercise places the athlete under. Here's another example. You are running 200 kilometers a week or cycling four or five hours a day. You understand that exercise is pushing you towards injury and overtraining and burnout. If I offered you growth hormone and testosterone with the promise that it would help recover and help undo the negative effects of doing that much exercise, then of course the drug is going to work because it's taking you from an unhealthy state of fatigue, burnout, injury, back towards a normal state. And that then enables you to train harder. And so when these scientists say that the only way to get better is through practice, well that's the point. The doping helps you practice more. It helps you practice harder. And so their comments reveal, in my opinion, a complete lack of understanding around what it takes to be an elite athlete and what it takes for an elite athlete to push up right up to the very physiological limits and recognize then that what you're doing with drugs is that you are returning that athlete to a more normal state so that they can do the same thing for longer or go that little bit harder. And I find it actually quite almost demoralizing that people involved in anti-doping don't seem to appreciate that. I think it's very important to understand how doping works if you are going to criticize the system by which doping is being policed. Anyway, that's my four minutes for today. Again, way over time. 
I will try to not allow four weeks to elapse until the next one, but bear with me while I'm on my travels. And thanks again for watching. We'll chat again soon. Ciao.